Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. And once again, I fear I may be tempting the dark cloud of demonetization given the subject of today's review, but that can't be helped. So screw it, here we go. We begin by traveling back in time to the year 1992. It was a year of ups and downs. The space shuttle Endeavour made its maiden voyage. Los Angeles erupted into chaos after the Rodney King verdict. The Dream Team destroyed all competition and route to a gold medal at the Summer Olympics. Sinead O'Connor ripped up a photo of Pope John Paul II on an episode of Saturday Night Live to protest sexual abuse at the hands of the Catholic Church, and was endlessly ridiculed for it. Until years later when, oopsie fuckles, it turns out she was right all along. And a shipping container filled with over 28,000 rubber ducks was lost in the Pacific Ocean. And those bath toys would continue to wash up on various shores around the world for years to come. No, I'm not making that up. Google it. And director Paul Verhoeven made a little movie that would have a huge influence on American cinema for years to come. That movie was Basic Instinct. Written by Joe Esterhaus, whose name has come up a few times in recent episodes, Basic Instinct is a neo-noir erotic thriller that featured groundbreaking depictions of sexuality, at least by Hollywood standards. The French were probably looking at this and thinking, stupid Americans, it seriously took you this long? We've been doing this shit since the 60s. Are you really that repressed? Yes. Yes, we are. The movie is about a San Francisco detective, Nick Curran, played by Michael Douglas, who is investigating a murder. The prime suspect is novelist and perpetually horny psychopath Catherine Trammell, played by Sharon Stone, who writes under the pseudonym Catherine Wolfe, though no one ever actually calls her that even when she's doing publicity for her books, so I'm not sure what the point of that was. Against his better judgment, and indeed everyone's better judgment, Nick becomes romantically involved with Catherine despite her being an obvious psychopath and an ever-growing list of people people around her who keep winding up dead. It was sexy. It was mysterious. It was risque. It was controversial. It was... Kinda goofy, honestly, which even Verhoeven would admit to. The premise of someone killing people just to see how much she can get away with is inherently ridiculous, and Stone's performance is a bit over the top. That said, I can't deny she is captivating. In every shot, Sharon is daring you to look away from her. And I dare not. The movie proved to be a huge hit, making over $350 million at the box office. But obviously it was not without controversy. It had very graphic depictions of sex and violence, so much so that Verhoeven's original cut got an NC-17, and he had to tone it down a bit to get an R. He does have some experience with that. It also meant they had to heavily re-edit and re-dub the film to air it on TV, with hilarious results. My sex life's actually pretty shitty since I stopped seeing you. My sex life's actually pretty shoddy since I stopped seeing you. The boys in Monty Python would be proud. The movie also attracted protests from gay rights groups as Catherine was openly bisexual and the activists claimed this continued a trend of negative depictions of lesbians and bisexuals in film, a point some critics agreed with. The filmmakers agreed to meet with the activists and Esterhaus himself even proposed some changes to the script based on their feedback. But the studio rejected the changes on the grounds that they weakened the script and the characters, which I find to be hilarious because the characters are not why people remember this movie. We'll come back to that. Verhoeven defended the film, stating he wasn't trying to depict homo or bisexuality in a negative light. After all, in his home country, being gay or bi didn't really have the negative stigma it has in the States. The Dutch have been fairly progressive compared to the rest of the world when it comes to LGBT rights. But he wasn't making a Dutch movie. He was making a movie in America for a primarily American audience, so of course things will be interpreted differently. And his refusal to acknowledge that seems short-sighted on his part. And there are a few moments where the movie doesn't exactly come across as gay-friendly, like the scene where Gene Triplehorn's character expresses embarrassment over a prior lesbian experience. I mean, what else can we take away from that, Paul? Verhoeven did recognize the activists' right to protest, but also seemed to suggest their actions were approaching fascism, which, come on, dude, no. Dumping glitter on a film set is not fascism. Fuck off. And yes, the activists did actually dump a shitload of glitter on a stretch of I-280 where they were filming. And I honestly have to respect that. For what it's worth, academic and social critic Camille Paglia denounced the protest and praised the film, especially Stone's performance and the Catherine Trammell character. Then again, Paglia also used to be a supporter of Nambla. Yes, that Nambla. You know, for the longest time I thought that was something South Park made up? Imagine my surprise when I found out it was real. 
Well, the North American Man Boy Love Association is real. The North American Marlon Brando lookalikes are not, but they damn well should be. And there was one more thing that made this movie especially infamous. This is what everyone remembers about Basic Instinct. Sharon Stone showing off her hoo-ha for the camera. For better or worse, it's an iconic moment in film history. But I personally tend to lean toward the worse side because according to Stone, her vulva was filmed without her knowledge. She had been wearing underwear that day, but Verhoeven asked her to take them off since they were reflecting the light and assured her only the shadow would be visible and her lack of underwear would just be implied. It wasn't until a test screening of the movie that she learned the truth. For the record, Verhoeven has denied Stone's claim and says she knew all along her vulva would be filmed, but to this day, Stone hasn't backed down. And I see no reason for her to lie about it, especially in this day and age, so I'm on Team Sharon here. Anyway, the movie was a huge hit and a highly influential film in Hollywood. Sure, Basic Instinct didn't invent the erotic thriller, but it certainly popularized it, and Hollywood started cranking those bitches out. Some of them I've talked about on this show before, as those types of movies often find themselves getting nominated for Worst Picture, or winning in the case of Color of Night. They didn't always earn critical acclaim, but they were somewhat popular. At least until the internet made actual porn more easily accessible and the pause and toss video rental became obsolete. And that brings us to the year 2006, when for some reason they decided to make Basic Instinct 2, but without Joe Esterhaus, Paul Verhoeven, or any of the original cast except for Sharon Stone, who reprised her role as Catherine Trammell. Nick Curran gets the briefest of mentions, just so we know that he was murdered off screen, possibly by Catherine, and that's it. And I say again, this was made in 2006. 14 years after the original Basic Instinct. The erotic thriller was already on life support at this point, and spoiler alert, Basic Instinct 2 did not resuscitate it. The movie had actually been in development hell since MGM bought the sequel rights to Basic Instinct in 1997, reportedly due to casting issues as Stone had final say over the leading man and rejected several of the studio's choices, including Benjamin Bratt and Aaron Eckert. Robert Downey Jr. was offered the role but declined. In 2001, MGM decided they'd had enough and scrapped the project entirely. But that same day, Stone filed a lawsuit claiming she had a verbal agreement with producers Mario Casar and Andrew Vina, who I've also mentioned on this show, for $14 million even if the movie didn't get made. The lawsuit was settled three years later when the studio said, fine, Sharon will make the damn movie, jeez. Unlike the original, which was set in San Francisco, Basic Instinct 2 went across the pond to London. Acclaimed English actor David Morrissey was cast opposite Stone as Dr. Michael Glass, and Scottish director Michael Caton Jones found himself in the chair. While Morrissey said he actually liked the script, Caton Jones thought the film was doomed to be terrible from the start, and later admitted he only took the job because he needed the money. Well, at least he was honest. We all gotta eat. The movie opens with Catherine driving entirely too fast through the streets of London with a barely conscious footballer in the passenger seat. A car. You don't have to. You're in a car. And with dialogue like this, I'm already struggling to figure out why Morrissey liked the script. And is this some dystopian future where London has become a ghost town? Where are the people? Where are the cars? Where are the police who should be stopping this crazy bitch driving 100 miles an hour? Anyway, the footballer, ahem, <clears throat> gives her a hand, which causes her to lose control and they crash into the river. Catherine puts forth the minimum amount of effort into freeing the footballer before giving up and saving herself leaving him to drown. Naturally, the police are not too happy about that, nor are they happy with the fact that the football player had a drug called DTC in his system, which is what paralyzed him and is not taken recreationally. And Catherine just happened to buy the drug from a dealer a few days ago. And they note she doesn't seem too broken up about his death. Of course I am, I'm traumatized. Who knows if I'll ever come again. Oh, shut up. This is a far cry from the police interrogation scene in the first movie. And not just because of, well, you know. In that famous scene, Catherine was definitely cocky, but she also came across as intelligent and in complete control of the situation. Here, she sounds like a homicidal maniac. She's practically begging the police to charge her. And yet... We haven't got a case for it. How do you figure? Even if she killed him accidentally, the law still tends to frown on that sort of thing. 
Do you not have negligent homicide in the UK? Catherine is ordered by the court to undergo a psychiatric evaluation by the highly respected Dr. Michael Glass. And right off the bat, Catherine ensures it will not go well for her. Is this where we're gonna do it? I feel so bad for that woman's lawyer. Whatever she's paying him, it ain't enough. Shockingly, Michael concludes Catherine is not well. She's a narcissistic psychopath with a risk addiction, and she's a danger to herself and others. And those are her best qualities. But she gets off, uh, let me rephrase that. The charges are dropped on a technicality, and she's a free woman. Nevertheless, Catherine appears to recognize she is, in fact, not well, and asks Michael to treat her professionally. He agrees to do so because, despite his education and professional experience and general acclaim among his peers, he's an idiot. And we hit the beats you'd expect to hit. Several people end up murdered, including a journalist who was writing a story on Michael, more on that in a minute, Michael's ex-wife who was also dating said journalist, small world, and some dude Catherine f***ed in an orgy whose name I can't be bothered to remember. It looks like Catherine may be involved with the murders, but they can't prove it. Somehow. Of course, we get explicit sex scenes, which I cannot show you, though not as many as you would think. One involves Michael and Catherine because, again, he's an idiot. And you'd think he, of all people, would be careful about this sort of thing because, as we are told by several characters in the film, he's had trouble with a patient before, which is why the aforementioned journalist was writing a story about him. Michael was treating a man named Cheslov, played by Sir not appearing in this film, who ended up killing his girlfriend. And while Michael was cleared of any wrongdoing, he privately wondered if he had missed a sign somewhere and could have stopped Cheslov from getting all murdery. So of course he ends up falling for someone who is almost certainly a murderer because having one dead person on his conscience just wasn't enough. Have I mentioned he's an idiot? And even when he has reason to suspect Catherine is the killer, he actually tries to cover for her. When he shows up at his ex-wife's place after the journalist has been killed, he finds Catherine's lighter on the floor, and instead of telling the police about it, he throws it in the trash. This proves to be pointless because the police end up finding the lighter anyway, but this doesn't lead to Catherine's arrest, even though I'm sure her fingerprints must be all over the damn thing. Why? Who the hell knows? It's one of many things in the story that doesn't make much sense. Like when Michael meets up with his ex in a bar and she tells him that she's scared to go out because of everything that's happened. But she's in a bar. And then she leaves the bar and goes to a club. For someone who's scared to go out, she sure is going out a lot. And then he follows her to the club and despite him being only a few steps behind her, someone was able to slash her throat and escape without being seen or heard. Bullshit. Anyway, Michael eventually confronts Catherine about the dead journalist and finds out she was also sleeping with him, which leads to more terrible dialogue. Why don't you just ask me, or is that, is that too direct for you? Did you kill him? If I said I didn't, would you believe me? Well, why did you want him to ask you then? Also, no. And after doing a pose that is not nearly as sexy as the movie thinks, she terminates the therapy, which should be the end of the story, but again, idiot. Michael continues his stupid obsession with Catherine, even as one of his colleagues begs him to stay away and refer Catherine to herself for therapy. I'm a woman. She'll relate to me differently. I seem to recall Catherine relates to both men and women. Actually, is that still true? Catherine was openly bisexual in the first movie, but in the sequel, that seems to have gone out the window. Sharon Stone said prior to the movie's release that her character would have a bisexual relationship, but something must have changed because where is that relationship? They suggest Catherine and Michael's ex knew each other, possibly in the biblical sense, but it's barely hinted at. All of her intimate relationships that we actually see are with men. Her bisexuality has pretty much been erased, which is an interesting choice and I have to wonder why they made it. We know they filmed a brief threesome and a scene where Catherine talks about a teenage lesbian experience, but these were cut from the film. I can't say for sure if this was a deliberate choice by the filmmakers or if it was necessary to avoid an NC-17. If it's the latter, screw the prudes at the Motion Picture Association. If it's the former, I can understand them not wanting to rehash the killer gay trope and portraying this character in a way that's more respectful to the LGBT community would present an interesting challenge. But rather than taking up that challenge, it seems like they just gave up and straight washed the character. I'm not sure if that's better or worse than the first movie, but it's definitely lazier.
getting back to the story, the movie, which is trying to be a murder mystery, attempts to leave the audience guessing as to the identity of the killer. Similar to the first movie, except shit. At first, it seems like it almost certainly has to be Catherine, but then we find out the detective investigating the murders, played by David Thewlis, has a shady past. And he has a motive because he was being investigated by the murder journalist. There are over 8 million people in London. How did these few become so tightly connected? There's even a point where Detective Shady Pants suggests Michael provide false testimony about Catherine so they can put her away and stop her before she kills again. Will not be worth it? Some kind of redemption for Cheslav at last? Yes, redeem yourself by committing a crime. Wait. Sir, I see a flaw in this plan. And there's that name again, Cheslav. He seems to be simultaneously the most and least important character in the film. He is mentioned constantly by pretty much everyone, and yet we never see him, not even in a flashback or photo, and we know virtually nothing about him except that he killed someone. He's the ever-present albatross around Michael's neck, but the movie never really gives us a reason to give a shit. Until the movie's climax, where it clumsily introduces some new info about Cheslov. Catherine attempts to convince Michael that Detective Shady Pants has been the real killer all along. And in fact, he was the one who killed Cheslov's girlfriend. Now, why would he do that? Well, Cheslov was a drug dealer, you see. And Detective Shady Pants killed the girlfriend and pinned it on Cheslov to put him away. Wouldn't it have been simpler to just, you know, plant drugs on the guy? I mean, he was a drug dealer. And cops planting drugs on people is, sadly, not unheard of. And yet, you instead expect me to believe that he resorted to murder to put this guy away? Not buying it. Michael then hears Detective Shady Pants trying to break down the door, so he takes Catherine's gun and... Wait a minute, how did she get a gun? I'm sure it's not impossible to find a handgun in London, but they are a lot harder to come by there than they are in the States. And the movie never even attempts to explain how she got it. And Michael shoots Detective Shady Pants and gets put in a psych ward. Catherine then comes to visit him, because she's allowed to do that for some reason, and presents him with a copy of her new book, loosely based on recent events. But in her version of the story, Michael was actually the killer all along and was manipulated by Catherine into committing the murders. This is the movie's attempt at an ambiguous ending, similar to the first movie, but it falls completely flat because Michael being the killer is utterly preposterous. It was silly enough to suggest Detective Shady Pants was the killer, but Michael makes even less sense. I suppose he has motive for killing those people, but the movie is told almost entirely from his point of view. We've seen every place he's been and every move he's made, and especially in the case of his ex-wife, it is impossible for him to have been the killer. And it is never remotely suggested at any point in the film that he might be an unreliable narrator. Catherine did it. That is the only plausible option. You're not giving the audience anything to think about. You're just making them wonder what the hell you were thinking. Basic Instinct 2 is inferior to the first movie in pretty much every way. The story is boring and makes no sense. The dialogue is weak. The characters are stupid and obnoxious. The performances are mediocre. It's not remotely sexy. Morrissey and Stone have no chemistry at all. About the only good thing I can say is at least it's shot well. Credit to the director, especially considering he only took the job for the paycheck, but that's not enough to recommend watching it. Not even ironically, because it doesn't fit the so bad it's good profile, even though there are times when it seems like it wants to be. The plot is ridiculous, but not enough to be funny. It's just confusing. Stone is over the top, but again, not enough to be entertaining, so she comes across as annoying. If you want to go camp, fine, but you gotta go all the way. And they didn't. The movie flopped at the box office, opening in 10th place and ultimately earning a little over half its $70 million budget. I bet Vina was wishing he had just paid her off. And it won Razzies for Worst Screenplay, Worst Prequel or Sequel, Worst Actress for Sharon Stone, and Worst Picture. It was also nominated for Worst Picture in the final Stinker's Bad Movie Awards, but lost to Blood Rain. So the movie is bad. Very bad, in fact. But was it the worst picture of 2006? Well, it did have some stiff competition in that category. Its fellow nominees consisted of two movies I've talked about on this show before. The aforementioned Blood Rain, an Uwe Ball video game adaptation that is indeed as bad as it sounds, and Lady in the Water, a ridiculous and shockingly self-indulgent film from M. Night Shyamalan. 
If that wasn't enough, we also had Little Man, a Wayans Brothers movie that superimposed Marlin's head onto a little person's body. And that's about the only thing it had going for it. And of course, the remake of The Wicker Man, which is primarily known for... Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! Yeah. So, does Basic Instinct 2 deserve worst picture honors? Honestly, no, I think the stinkers had it right. I gotta go with Blood Rain. As bad as Basic Instinct 2 is, it's not Uwe Ball video game adaptation bad. Sure, both movies had bad sex scenes, terrible dialogue, and subpar acting, but Blood Rain got a bad performance out of Ben Kingsley. How do you get a bad performance out of Ben fucking Kingsley? That should not be possible. Basic Instinct 2 also did not have Blood Rain's laughably bad action sequences, piss poor editing, and god awful wigs. Jesus, I'd forgotten how many bad wigs were in this movie. With the money Ball saved by hiring prostitutes instead of actual extras for Meatloaf scene, you'd think they could afford one decent wig at least. You know what the damnedest thing is? While Ball himself has won Worst Director Razzies, he has never made a movie that won Worst Picture. Seriously, I checked, and only two of his movies have ever been nominated. I'm not sure why that is. Perhaps the Golden Raspberry Foundation figured he was deliberately trying to win and considered it cheating? I don't know. In any case, Basic Instinct 2 sucks, but Blood Rain sucks the most. Get it? Because there's vampires in the movie? And vampires suck? I should wrap this up. Next time, we're looking at a movie that is widely considered to be one of the worst ever made, but it also has quite a cult following. Hey, it worked for Showgirls. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Thanks. <laughs>